Thank you for staying. It says wonderful things about your bladders. <laughs> That's what Hitchcock said. You it's know not that? that long. No, but you know, Hitchcock said, he said, the motion picture should only be as long as your bladder's capacity. <laughs> it's true. He said that. He was a smart guy. I'm going to start with you, James. Why? Oh. All right, go ahead, Dennis. All right. go um, ahead. Can you tell us just about how you conceptualize this film? Because, you know, it's you, as you alluded to in the introduction, it's very much a film that is drawn on your real life, your childhood. But I think there's so much else going on around it um, in terms of, you know, I think it's a portrait of America in 1980 as well. So I think it's a portrait of America now. Sure. I mean, here's the thing. When, when I wrote that, people, it's funny because people say, well, when did you come up with the script? Did you come up with the script just now? It's like movies take forever to get made. Mm -hmm. Even uh, something that seems like it's a no-brainer that the studio will immediately green light, right? It's like five years later the movie comes out. And I wrote this. I, I had gone, oh, you mean me. But it's a very solitary job writing the script. Um, I had had a tradition where I told bedtime stories to my children. And now they're, they don't care. They're all back in LA. They're having a nice time. My son's driving. It's terrifying. But at the time, they loved hearing the stories. And uh, they loved hearing the ones about my childhood the most. They loved the details. They loved the hamster put in the plastic ball and all this. Anyway, um, so I, one day we were uh, here in New York. My, my wife, Allie, said, well, why don't we go to the beach? And then uh, across the 59th Street Bridge, they said, uh, let's, let's go see the old neighborhood, Daddy. So I took them. And um, there was some evidence uh, that we had lived there. There was some uh, paint on the side where I had made my little models. Uh, and there was this gate which had a regal G in it that my father had put up a fence to protect the estate. <laughs> um, but my kids were like, really, like, this is it? I mean, it was a, it, there was very little other evidence that we had lived there. And I was overwhelmed with a feeling of melancholy because all those dinners that felt so vitally important, so critical, so, uh, you know, the, the my grandmother, my grandfather, so important, and they're all gone. And there's almost no evidence that they ever even existed. And uh, the ephemerality of it really struck me. And then in 2019, I was doing an opera in Paris. I was by myself. I, you know, it was like a gilded cage. And I just started writing it. And I finished the script uh, well before, you know, obviously the January 6th stuff and, and before George Floyd. But it weirdly, it doesn't, it, it, it seemed to reverberate anyway. And I still fought to get it made after, you know, the world ended pandemic. And I, I don't want to bore you with all this, but we finally got the film made. So, but it was written in the September, October, November of 2019. Since we have the, um, the cast here, I just wanted to maybe bring them into it. And maybe we can start with the boys. And if you can tell us how you found Banks and Jalen. How I, you want me to tell? I mean, it's you great. Can start and well, then I I'll tell them, them I, they, can, oh, they can weigh in. But I just saw 600 boys per character and got in front of the laptop and spent, you know, nine bajillion hours with lots of green tea watching audition after audition. And uh, there were uh, there's a huge number of very talented people. It's not like there was a shortage of really talented kids. But for whatever reason, the, the numbers get winnowed down to maybe 10 or 8 for each person. And then I read with each one. And these guys were the ones that stuck out as being right for the role and having a wonderful intelligence and sensitivity. And I mean, I loved them. I loved them. And yeah, they're great. I remember a friend of mine in L.A. read the script. He goes, yeah, the script's pretty good, but it's going to live and die if you get a bad kid, you f you're screwed. <laughs> so if I get bad kids, I'm screwed. That's correct. I mean, what do you mean? You get bad actors, the movie's screwed. Yes, that's correct. But, but he's like, no, no, it's risky. Bad, ki bad kids, the whole thing is ruined. I'm like, thank you for the inspiration. <laughs> so, um, uh, but I wound up improvising with these guys through Zoom, and both of them were great at listening and responding in character. And that's eventually we, I mean, I'm so happy I chose them. But Banks and Jalen, maybe you can talk a little bit about your experience, because I think your friendship 
your character's friendship is really crucial to this film, and I'm wondering about your relationship on set as well. Well, Banks and I, before we started filming, we had two weeks to build that bond in school. So just every day, Banks and I, we would do school together, and we would use that time to get to know each other, and we found out that we had a lot in common. And we, we did a bunch of crazy things together. We explored New York, uh, we went on the subways, and that was my first time in New York, so that was just amazing. And when we, on the first day of filming, you know, we didn't really have to fake a friendship because we already built one. I think um, my favorite memory was definitely when we explored the neighboring hotel and oh. the lady <laughs> yelled at us. Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah. It was late. We got yelled at. We ran back home. <laughs> and maybe you can talk about Jeremy and Anne. I mean, you know, you sort of had to cast them for characters who were inspired by your parents, but also had to be these characters who were not your parents. Well, I didn't want, as I said to you earlier, I didn't want, you know, the rich little impersonation of my parents. Yeah. Uh, although I think that might be interesting, actually, now that I think about it. But um, no, I, it, it's not my parents. It's a, I mean, it is, but it isn't. It's funny because I had some description of the character. I was a Jewish Stanley Kowalski with a PhD. I was earthy. I don't know what to say in after <laughs> that, sorry. What, but what I will say is that it's a very strange thing because I was pretty withholding with both of them. I didn't want it to be an imitation, you know? So I didn't tell them that much. I told them as much as they begged me for and less. But then, weirdly, I see the movie now, I see my parents. I, they, I'll give you a, a brief example. Both Annie and Jeremy had the weird ability to channel them, even though there was a lot they didn't know. So, for example, there was this thing where the car, a very simple thing ripped, written, the car pulls up after the funeral, the family gets out, walks to the house. Action, and by the way, this is one of the great treasures of being a director when you're working with fantastic people. They, you know, Diagolev said, Etonne moi, surprise me, the actors do great things. And I said, action, all of a sudden car pulls up, he goes, lock the doors, which is something my father said all the time. Right, Ed? Are you here, Ed? I don't know where he is. My brother's out there somewhere, I hope. Didn't, didn't Dad always say, lock the doors? You know, leave the house. Leave, leave, leave. Um, and, and then Anne does this amazing thing where she turns her back to camera, Banks goes to comfort her, and she goes like this and walks back to the house, which is so like them. I never told you guys to lock the door, or shun the, the kids comforting. I never told you guys to do that. No, but I think, <clears throat> I th you know, I, our job is to have a foundational understanding of, of who these people were, and I think, you know, there, there was enough that you, you, you did give us, and then... And then you know we did our own sort of interrogating and our own work uh, that that you learn about their perspective and and um, that seemed that was just uh, yeah an instinct sure sure but I mean I I, I had I had James uh, ask the Proust questionnaire to his father and record it and film it and you know that gives you a pretty amazing composite view of a, of a of a person and. So there was enough enough clues in there. I have to say, James is a very fun director to surprise because he laughs really loudly behind the monitor when he likes something. And Jalen observed the other day that even when it's a very, very heavy scene, you just hear James cackling. <laughs> and that means you're doing something right. When he gets quiet, then you get nervous. Well, I laugh when I see things that I feel that are authentic to me. So he improvises, you know, what a schmuck. I start laughing hysterically. <laughs> I don't know. It seemed accurate to me to who my dad was, our dad was. So I, you know, I like that. I laugh. When you do things in the kitchen, when you go oh, like this and oh, touch your head, I laugh. What can I tell you? I remember some more serious scenes that you laughed at. Go ahead. <laughs> embarrass me in front of them. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm just saying, I, I distinctly remember the scene where Jeremy abuses me, um, 
I'm just, I'm just gonna leave it at that. Here's the thing, I, Banks, I love you and you know that. But that is not true. I mean, I was, that was a very tough day on set. I, I mean, I'm, just, I'm just gonna leave it at that. Okay. All I said was the scene, the scene with where Jeremy abuses me. Right. Dumpling suckers. <laughs> well, that I laughed at, that was, but that's real. I was a jerk. I was a jerk. My brother will confirm that I was a jerk. I'm going to ask one more to all of you, and then maybe you can take one or two from the audience. This question of you know not just um, who the characters were modeled on, but the sense of the film. There's a sense of um, tactility and materiality in the film. This idea of like you really feel the texture of the time and place. And I'm wondering if you drew on objects from your childhood, photographs, or you know just. I mean, the design is incredible in the film. The production yeah. design, the costume design, but. You know, were there things, artifacts from your childhood that you dredged up and shared with your actors and your crew? And well, totally. A lot of the times, the only restriction was, frankly, getting people to let me use certain images. I really was very, dis I was very depressed that I could not use Muhammad Ali versus Superman comic book, which yes, did exist. The the cover of which I wanted to use. Um, but other than that, I mean, I, I did consult my brother a lot. I consulted, obviously, uh, um, uh, an unc my uncle. And as best I could remember, my own things. We got the chandelier right. We, and my brother was telling me about the china the, with the green flowers on the edge. And now we got that. And uh, a lot of the details. Because I felt that, you know, in the end, it's one of the, actually, if I'm not going to go into Jeremiah, don't worry, but it's one of the problems, in a way, with social media, which is that you can reduce everything to a sentence or two. But really, if I said to you, you could do this with any work of, uh, dare I use the word, art, uh, oh, you just total generalize, uh, another movie that glamorizes mobsters, and you could be talking about The Godfather or Goodfellas, you know? So the point is, what differentiates and actually Robert Evans himself said this about The Godfather, what differentiates um, one movie from another? It is in the details. It's making sure that the small things, the behavior, the small touches of behavior, the small, because every story's already been told. Nuance does matter. That's my opinion. So, uh, th well, thank you. But it is why, it is why because nuance matters, it's why we get the, the instant disposability of the one or two word re review is frankly for our, it's sort of a cancer, I think. Jeremy, this doesn't this this isn't really an answer to your question at, at all. But um, <laughs> I, 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 we haven't seen the movie since Can and and James has subsequently done some work on it and. Uh, I found it very hard. Um, it, it's so painful in so many ways, this movie. And the I, f I feel like I was brought to this place of dilemma and these insoluble choices that people have to make or, or choices that they don't make and then live with for the rest of their lives. And um, I was just, yeah, I was just really moved by it tonight. Um, yeah, I, wa I watched it, yeah. Um, He's nuts. You sat through it again? Wow, that's but very But this sweet. thing of choosing social acceptance over integrity, really. And I thought about Muhammad Ali and how he represented well, integrity to uh, you. Uh, and exactly, well, it was Muhammad Ali and the Beatles. Because, uh, the, you know, the, the Ali's integrity is clear, right? 1967 to 70, he doesn't fight. I remember... And part of this is the whole 1980 thing. The Beatles represented the same thing to me because 1966, they stopped touring. And there was no guarantee that Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart, where they're dressing up in costumes and calling themselves something else, that's risk. Nobody knew that would be a huge legendary album. You, part of the crisis of our age is we haven't figured out how to monetize integrity. So everything becomes totally transactional. That's like the tr that's like Trump, right? Like they came down to Mar-a-Lago and I got the paper. You know what I mean? It's like everything is how it makes money for somebody. That's a crucial sickness in the culture. And so, well, 
But here's the thing, Ali and the Beatles represented that for me. And in September of 80, Ali, who had beaten Spinks uh, on a rematch, lost in humiliating fashion to Larry Holmes. And I remember as a kid being devastated. And then two months later, Lennon was killed here in New York. And I felt, I, I knew, and I, I know I don't speak only for myself. I knew something had changed big time that the 70s were like a hangover from the 60s, but you still got the drippings of it, the desire for change, a kind of radicalism in the air. And it ended there. I really felt it. I was, just one more brief aside, and then I promise we'll get any question you want. I was in Paris, I was at, uh, at the Cinematheque, and I was about to go on stage. And um, the guy who was interviewing me, and he says, ah, uh, James Gray, James Gray. You are an American. I said, yeah, that's correct. <laughs> he says that you lost something. And I kind of went, thank you. I'm going to go on stage now. I mean, it was a horrible thing to hear. And I think it begins there. The message beca became, you know, those who die with the most toys wins. That kind of bullshit. And the society got crueler and angrier. And now look where we are. Anyway, I'm sorry to get on a soapbox, but. Um, I'm getting the sign that we have time for one audience question. So we should make it a good one. Do you what was the budget and the shooting sketch? No. Uh, you sh James, you should pick it. No, you no, no, you do it. You okay. can moderate. I okay. can't okay. okay. I can't either, but. Um, They're all going to the whoever was shouting, yeah. Okay, yeah, there, okay. I'll try to summarize. That's a pretty good question, though. That's good, yeah. Good. Um, I, this, um, the person who asked the question is a middle school teacher. Um, and the question is about, I guess, just the commitment to the truth, but also this, I guess, the idea that you're making a fiction from. Yeah, it's like, yeah, I, I mean, you want to respond to it? Or, like, well, I, it's, it's a fantasia on my life. It's not, the f not a documentary. Uh, and you have to take those risks because it's shorthand. I'm going to tell you something which you probably shouldn't admit in public, but what the fuck. <laughs> my, the scene in the bathroom, my father was much worse with me in real life. Much worse. Now, we didn't do that because if we did, I didn't have enough narrative time to make us not hate him after that. We still made it worse than it was in the text. That's true. We, yeah, you actually made it worse than it was in the text. Because you, you had told me what it really yeah. was. But, the re, the, but so you, in that way, we pulled back. In other places, like the scene you're talking about in the hallway, which I think Annie's genius in, I'm biased. She, incredible. And by the way, super gutsy, super gutsy, because the big movie star, and she's not so sympathetic. You're laughing, it's very gutsy to do because it's, it takes a lot for an actor, not that actors want to look good, but it's, that's courage to say, I don't want to be loved, I want to be truthful. That's not easy. Sorry, you go ahead and you can. Well, uh, thank you for that. And um, um, it's an interesting, situation, right? Because we're creating something in an attempt to tell the truth that's predicated upon a performance. And one of my favorite things about cinema is it can always tell if you're lying. And one of my favorite things about James Gray is so can he. <laughs> and he's not interested. He's not interested. Uh, he said something to all of us, kind of blew all of our minds. He goes, I don't want you to nail it. I never want to hear about an actor nailing a scene. If they've nailed a scene, then they've, they've lost me. They've, and I found that incredibly liberating, the idea that I wasn't there to give in a, a performance. I was there to exist as a character that I'd spent a great deal of time understanding. And I'm not terribly afraid of telling truths that are ugly because I think that there is truth in ugliness. I think that there's uh, sympathy in it and an, an opportunity to learn and a chance to stoke compassion. And so I wasn't, I wasn't af 
afraid of it because, well, because I knew it was true, but also because I thought in our country, we have a lot of conversations about family, but very rarely do we actually talk about where love and violence intersect and how it's not very, and, and they don't often, like it's not like one shuts off when the other one begins. And, um, and how complicated it can be, how complicated all this is. And when I read the script and just knowing James Gray and his integrity as a filmmaker, I just thought, here's a chance to tell the truth with someone. And that's always the scariest thing is that you're gonna swing at telling the truth and, and lie. And I knew that in this case, and I, and I actually wanna take an opportunity to shout out the incredible craftspeople that worked on our film, many of whom are in the audience. <laughs> Because when you were asking about details, details before, James was, I mean, obviously our leader, but it was a group lift. It was something that we all did together. We all shared as many notes as, as we had. And the goal was not to create a portrait of the 80s that you would look, the goal was not to nail it. The goal was to show people who were alive. And that was a million details blended together in a way that was truthful. So I, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. you. Know, one, one last thing I would add is beautiful. One, one last thing I would add. There is this belief, and we've talked about this, there is this belief that beauty and pretty are the same thing. They're not. To make something beautiful can also mean that it's very sad. Sadness is beautiful. Sadness is part of the human experience. And sometimes you get the sense in the culture that well, it's, not, it's not commercial, people don't want to feel sad or whatever. No, sadness is part of life. Disappointment is part of life. Regret is part of life. Art needs to reflect that. So when we set off on this, I know I said this to you. I said, be beautiful. Don't worry about being pretty, you know, that you can reveal all of this stuff that maybe doesn't feel so great. It's all right. That was my approach anyway. But anyway, thank you for coming. I, you, you've got like time people here. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank all of you for this beautiful and moving film. And thank you for being with us. Thank you.